Please, in your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. In your church NIV Bible, that's page 1173, Ephesians chapter 2. If you haven't found it, give me an amen. Okay, so you haven't found it yet? I got you there. (laughs) Paul speaking here, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness for us, to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We love your word. We delight in your word and we meditate on your word day and night. May your word be in our hearts. Lord, speak to us, we pray this morning. Speak into our hearts. May we hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. Amen. So we are beginning our journey through the book of Ephesians again. And last week, I asked the question, I asked this question, I said, can you remember what happened when you gave your life to Jesus Christ? What happened? What was your feelings? What was going on inside you? And what was commonly mentioned was that there was a change. People experienced a gradual change in their behaviours and in their desires. That's what came up. That was the common theme that there was this gradual change, there was this increasing thirst to, to know Christ more and to live for him. Do you agree? It increased and it grew and it grew. Thank you for the amen over there. In this letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Christians that are there, both Jew and Gentile, that's the non-Jew. And his whole point of this letter is that they will be unified in Christ. In Christ you are unified. In Christ, we are brothers and sisters. Amen? Might have different uh, skin shades and melanin in in our skin, but we are brothers and sisters when we are in Christ. Now, in chapter one, Paul is speaking about their spiritual blessings. We've looked at that over the last couple of weeks. Their spiritual blessings in Christ. And here in chapter two, Paul is now speaking about their spiritual possession, sorry, spiritual position, very close. So he was speaking about their spiritual possessions, and now he's speaking about their spiritual position in Christ. Now, when we look at verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2, we have two subsections. And this is a fact as well, this is interesting. Verses 1 to 10 was one long sentence in the original Greek, did you know that? Verses 1 to 10 was one long sentence in the original Greek. No commas, no full stops. Anyway, we have two subsections in verses 1 to 10. Verses 1 to 3 is about hopelessness and helplessness without Christ. Hopelessness and helplessness without Christ. In verses 4 to 10 now, it's about hope in Christ. Hope in Christ. So let's look at section one. Hopelessness and helplessness without Christ. Verses one to three. 
Now, humankind began with Adam. How many of us know that? It began with Adam. Despite what they tell you at school or in the educational system, it began with Adam, as we read in the book of Genesis. And as sons and daughters of Adam, we entered the world spiritually dead. Everyone say spiritually dead. That is how we entered the world. What does it mean to be spiritually dead, you may be asking? Well, think about it. When a person is physically dead, they have no life. Yeah, no breath. They are unresponsive. So, for a person to be spiritually dead, it means that they have no responsiveness towards God. When we're talking about spiritually dead. No responsiveness towards God. It's to have no inclination towards God. To have no ability to please God. Unable to understand spiritual things and appreciate them. That's what it means to be spiritually dead. You just have no interest in God. You have no responsiveness towards God. No inclination towards God. And you do not understand spiritual things. And I do hope this morning that none of us are sitting here spiritually dead. Before we became followers of Christ, that is what we were. Spiritually dead. Now, two weeks ago, I mentioned how not only is physical DNA transferred from parent to child, but so is spiritual DNA. Did you know that? Physical DNA like features, eyes, feet, hair, color, you know, all those sorts of things. Those things are transferred. But also, so are spiritual things transferred as well. And we are affected and sometimes we are suffering the consequence of things that our parents or grandparents have done. But just like a stone thrown into water or like a bomb detonating, sin has an impact, always has done. And then it has a rippling effect. It kind of ripples outwards, affecting people around it. That's how sin is. It has an immediate impact and then it has this rippling effect. So when Adam and Eve sinned and when they rebelled against God, it had an impact. And then it had a knock-on effect throughout all humanity. The knock-on effect has affected all of humankind. This is what we call original sin. You can call it ancestral sin. And so as a result of this original sin, we have power struggles between husband and wife. How many of you know there's power struggles between husband and wife? So married people are keeping quiet. Okay, well, there are power struggles between husband and wife. It goes back to original sin. We have power struggles with animals. God put man to be in control of animals. Now, animals don't obey. There's a power struggle there. It goes back to original sin. Even the ground itself, we have a struggle with the ground. We have to sweat, we have to toil, we have to labor to produce crops. How many of you have got gardens with weeds in it, choking out your plants, and you have to cut them out? So this original sin has affected humanity as well as the things around it. So, we have no inclination towards God, and we are unable to please God. Verse 1 shows that we are dead. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. We are dead. Verse 2 shows that we are disobedient towards God. Verse 3 shows that we are depraved and doomed. Depraved is when you're so far in sin, you can't even make head or tell what's going on. You're just, your whole mind is gone. Depraved and doomed. All this was before, before we were in Christ. Before we were in Christ. This is what Paul is communicating to the Ephesian Christians, the Jew and the Gentile. Paul is reminding his readers that they were in alienation. They were in alienation towards God. They were separate from God. Before we were in Christ, we gratified the cravings of our flesh. To gratify means to indulge. It means to please and to satisfy that's what we did, those things that our flesh wanted. That's what we did. We craved them and we satisfied them. The flesh in this context 
is the fallen and rebellious nature that we were born with. It is the part of our nature that makes us disobey God. We all have a part of us that wants to disobey God. Even when you become a Christian, that part of your nature is still there. It's called the old man, the old nature. It lurks, it's lurking there. It doesn't totally go until we receive a new and glorified body. When we go to be with the Lord, that's when it will be totally gone. But we still, even as Christians, have this sin nature in us that we have to put under subjection. Now here's the thing. We are all born with the sin nature and so we are controlled by it, the flesh. We all seek to gratify and please what our flesh desires, or every single one of us. We are controlled by three things, the world, what the world has to offer, the temptations of the world. We are controlled by our own flesh, we have our own sinful and lustful desires. And then Satan, who Paul says in verse 2, is the ruler of the air. Paul calls him the ruler of the air. So in ancient Jewish times, it was believed that Satan ruled in that middle sphere of heaven and earth, in that middle sphere, which is the sky, the ruler of the air. So you see, we are, and we were, spiritually dead, spiritually disobedient to God, depraved in our sins and doomed. Verse 3 says that by nature, we are deserving of wrath. Did you know that? By nature, we are deserving of God's wrath. Yes, we have God's wrath and righteous anger upon us, and we deserve it. But this is before we were in Christ, because we were spiritually dead. Now, here is another problem. The sinner cannot change their sin nature on their own. The sinner cannot overcome the world on their own. And the sinner cannot overcome Satan on their own. The sinner needs something else. They need some outside help. The sinner needs outside help. And so this now brings me to the second section. The second section. Hope in Christ, verses 4 to 10. There is hope for those who are spiritually dead this morning. Amen? There is hope. It's not all doom and gloom. There is hope. Now, in other Bible versions, verse 4 says, but God. It starts off by saying, but God. And I like that. Verse 1 to 3, we are doomed. We are hopeless. But in verse 4, but God. You see the hope now comes in. But God. That changes everything now. God who has a great love for us and is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Did you catch that, church? Are we alive this morning? Are we awake this morning? God, who has a great love for us and is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. There was nothing that we did to deserve it, by the way. We were dead in our sins, and God, by his grace, has made us alive. God, by his grace, has made us alive. Now, here is an interesting point. This is the bit that many people struggle with, including Christians, especially Christians. Many Christians battle with this because I think it sounds too good to be true. I think that's why people battle with this. It sounds too good to be true especially when we look back at our lives and how we used to be. Verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. How are we saved this morning? It is by grace. That is it. God's grace is what saved us. God's grace. You are saved by God's grace. That is it. We are saved because of God's immeasurable love and his kindness towards us. That is it. When we believed, which was through faith, by the way, God saved us. Amen? Well, check this out. Even the faith that you had to believe in God 
is not something to boast about. Verse 9. We need to believe in God. We need faith to believe in God. But even your faith to believe in God is not something that you can even boast about. Verse 9. Because even though you and I needed faith to believe in Jesus Christ, that faith is also a gift of God. Did you know that? The very faith that you need to believe in God is actually a gift as well. So there's nothing about you in this equation. It is God's grace and it is through faith and the faith that you used, God gave you that faith as a gift. Do you see how there's nothing to do with us here? God's love, God's grace. God's love, God's grace. Can you see why people struggle with this? Including those who are already saved. We struggle with this. That is just by grace that we are saved through faith. I am saved because of God's grace and that is it. In other religions, you have to do things, don't you? In other religions, you have to do things. We call it work-based religions. We all want to do things, don't we, to please God. We feel like we have to. That's how our disposition is, that we've got to do something. We've got to do things. We always feel as if we have to do something, make some kind of sacrifice. Overcome some great task. Deprive ourselves of something. Go on a, 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 a pilgrimage of some kind, some sort of special journey. We feel we have to make ourselves worthy, don't we? Do you not feel that sometimes, that we have to make ourselves a bit feel more worthy? That's why some people don't come to church. They're going through things in their lives and they feel that only when they're ready, only when they're sorted out, they then can, then, they can then come to church. And what they don't understand is that they are never going to be sorted out enough to come before a holy God. Come as you are. You can't get it all together. You can't get it all sorted out before you start coming to church and, and spending time with the Lord with your other brothers and sisters. Come as you are. I think about the Muslim community. We pray for them. They do a whole bunch of things, don't they? Five praying five times a day, fasting, Ramadan, almsgiving, the pilgrimage that they want to do. After all of that, they are still not even guaranteed paradise. Can you imagine? What they say is it's all to do with Allah's mercy. Their good and their bad is weighed up at the end of it. And if, you know, God, if Allah has mercy upon them, then they can go to paradise. Some even believe that if you fight for jihad, you fight this holy war, you bomb yourself up, suicide bombing, you will have a fast track into paradise. There's no guarantee. Yes, we all need God's mercy. I'm not just disputing that. We all need God's mercy. But when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, my blessed assurance is that Jesus is mine. Amen? And that eternity awaits with the Lord for me. It's guaranteed. If you have friends from other religions, do not believe the lie that all religions are the same. Stop believing that nonsense. It's not possible that all religions are the same. It's not possible. Truth by nature is exclusive. That's what truth is, it's exclusive. Whatever doesn't agree with it is the opposite to it. So if your drink is hot, it cannot be cold at the same time. If your drink is hot, it cannot be cold. It's objectively hot. Now, another problem that we do have is that people would then say it's relative. So I might decide it's not really hot, it's actually quite cold. And that's the other issue that we fall into. But truth is exclusive. All religions are either all wrong or one of them is possibly right. I'm not saying it necessarily, necessarily has to be Christianity. But they all can't be right together, can they? Let me say that again. All religions are either all wrong or at least one of them is possibly right, but they cannot all be right. Why? Because they oppose each other. The fundamentals of every religion opposes each other, so they cannot all be right. They can all be wrong, or one can possibly be correct. For Christianity, it is this. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then there is no Christian faith. It's as simple as that. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, there is no Christianity. 
Christianity holds on to that one important fact, one important thing, is that Jesus rose again. So he is who he said he is. Islam denies Jesus even died in the first place, let alone resurrected. They deny that he even died in the first place, let alone resurrected. Other religions do not have any kind of saviour for sin. Concerning sin and evil, there's no saviour. There's no rescue mission in no other religion greater than the one where, you know, Jesus died for our sins. God's son. That's the only greatest love that I know of in any religion. And so I firmly this morning believe that Christianity provides the best worldview for topics such as the origin and creation and sin and evil and eternal punishment. It deals with the best solution for all of those things. So my point this morning is that there's no deeds that we can do to be saved. There's nothing that you can do to be saved. We do not come close to God's holiness, not even on our best day. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64 verse 4, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Think about that. All our righteous acts, we put on our best clothing, our righteous acts before the Lord is filthy. Before a holy God, we are filthy. So I did, I'm this morning saved by grace. Are you saved by grace this morning? By God's grace. It is by grace through faith alone that I am saved. It is never grace plus religious works that save you. Whenever you've got grace plus something else, there's no salvation there. Whenever it's grace plus something else that you have to add on to it, and we know that even like the Catholic Church, there's so many other elements to the Catholic Church that you add on to your grace to, to, to be saved. It's not grace plus anything else. This is what Paul is really hammering home in this, in this uh, chapter. It is never grace plus religious works and deeds that equals salvation. It is only grace through faith that equals salvation. Only grace. By grace through faith alone. We sang the song earlier, only by grace can we enter, only by grace can we stand, not by our human endeavour, but by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Okay, only by grace. I end here this morning. We were once dead, but now we've been made alive in Christ. That's something we need to be excited about. And Paul is letting the Jew and the Gentile know that they are unified, they are in Christ, and they were once dead, but now they have been made alive with Christ. Amen.